Um, Genesis chapter 26, uh, verse 12 to 15. It says, Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. If you go back a little bit in this story, uh, Abraham is, is, has passed away, and Isaac, uh, his son, finds himself in the middle of a famine. And so Isaac makes the decision that what he's going to do is he's going to head off to Egypt. To Who knows why? The Bible doesn't tell us why. But by going to Egypt, he would somehow thought this would be the solution to the problem that he had, whatever the famine was, that maybe in Egypt they would have food, they would feed him and his family and his servants and all that stuff. Uh, often in the Bible, Egypt is referred to as the world. Uh, it's referred to as the world system. It's referred to... Uh, in many, many situations as a place that we don't necessarily want to go back to. Okay? So at this stage, we haven't seen the Exodus. At this stage, we haven't seen Israel uh, become subjected to the Egyptians and so on. But the picture of Egypt in the Bible is one of, of a place that we don't want to go back to. It's a place that represents the world, world system and the way the world does things. And so Isaac's made the decision, I've got this need here, I'm in the middle of a famine... How I'm going to manage that and deal with that, I'm going to go to Egypt. I'm going to go and see if I can find help for this situation in Egypt. It says in, uh, in verse 12, Isaac sowed in the land where he was, and he reaped in that same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. On his way to Egypt, God spoke to him and said, I don't want you to go to Egypt, I want you to go to Gerah, and I want you to stay there. I guess in that situation, if you're, uh, if you're uh, Isaac, you're probably in this situation where you go, well, if I go to Egypt, I'm pretty confident that there'll probably be food there and I'll probably be, be taken care of. But God says, no, don't go there. That might be the logical route, but I'm telling you to stop here. And so he obeys God and he stops in this place. And as we can see, uh, God blessed him for his obedience. How many of you know God blesses obedience? Sometimes what God asks of us may not make the greatest logical sense. Sometimes it may not be the, uh, the option that culture might say is the smartest but uh, we live uh, on a different plane than just what we see, taste, touch, smell, and feel. Is that right? We have God with us. And God said, stay in Jerry. He did, and it says the Lord blessed him. And then it says this, the man began to prosper. Uh, anyone got an old King James Version Bible at home? Read this. I love what it says. It actually says in the King James that he waxed great. He waxed great. And I'm sort of thinking of Isaac with a surfboard, you know, doing these ones. But we don't speak that way anymore, waxed great. It says that the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. So he began to prosper, he continued prospering until he became very prosperous. I love that picture there. He begins to prosper, continues prospering, and becomes very prosperous. There's almost like this picture of going onward and upward with God, of going forward, of standing up and walking, of growth and momentum in his life as he obeys God and lives for God and does what God's telling him to do. I think when we read the New Testament, it's fairly obvious to me in the New Testament that there's a similar kind of thought that those of us that cleave together with God, those of us that take his yoke upon us, that spiritually we are meant to go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. We are meant to be moving forward. I don't think God wants us to get to a point where we then stop and begin to spiritually die. And I've said before, I'll say it again, if you're in this place and you feel like you're spiritually dying, I would rather you found another church to go to because I don't want to know that we're playing a role in you spiritually dying. Amen? Find somewhere where there's water. Find somewhere where you're spiritually thriving and growing because I think that's what God wants for us. He doesn't want us taking backwards spiritual steps. God actually wants us to grow in intimacy with him and understanding of him and relationship with him and so on. He wants us to, as Isaac does here, begin to prosper, continue prospering and become very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. The Philistines envied him. You ever, you ever had something really good happen to you or, or God has blessed you, but the people around you got jealous of, it's like, it's not my fault. It's, it's God. I can't help it that God's blessing me at the moment. I can't help it that God is looking favorably upon me. I can't help it that I'm growing in my love with Jesus and you're not. I can't help it that my passion for Jesus is increasing. I can't help it that uh, I, I've got... God just, for whatever reason, God's blessing me. And, and sometimes when we're in that position, sometimes people around us can be a little skeptical. And people can want to sort of speak ill of that and 
wonder what's going on. What are you doing? It's, uh, look, sometimes God blesses. And when we're obedient, God blesses. And this is what's happening here. But the Philistines envied him, it says. It says, now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they'd filled them with earth. When we lived in India, one of my favorite villages was a place out in the middle of nowhere and it had a well. And what I loved the most about this particular village was it was the only village when we went there, the elders of the village would let us jump in the well. So there's this massive big hole in the ground. We'd get to stand up on these stone cobble things and just pin drop, bang, and go down. Probably It was about probably 8 to 10 metres. And bang, we'd splash into the water. And then along the edge of the well were sort of stones kind of sticking out and so you could climb back uh, out of the well. Um, now, considering they, that well was the source of the water that they drank... Probably wasn't a really smart thing in hindsight, but they, they let us do it anyway. Who knows what else had jumped in there before we got there, so it probably wasn't wise on our parts either. But that water in that well, it was the source of, of, of life for them. It was how they watered their crops out in the middle of nowhere. You need water. It was how they fed their livestock out in the middle of nowhere. You need water. There's no rivers, there's no creeks or tributaries there, and so they needed water. It was what they used to make a cup of tea. It was what they used to cook their food in. It's what they washed their clothes in. There was no pipeline like we have here in the West, so the well was an essential thing for the prosperity of the village. It provided water for drinking, washing, cooking, growing crops, feeding animals. In fact, if you have no well, you have no village. If you have no well, you have no village because you need access to water. You need access to water if you want to sustain life. You need access to water if you want to have a village. Now it says the Philistines were envious of Isaac. So Isaac begins to prosper and then continues prospering, becomes very prosperous. So in order to slow down his progress, they were envious of him. They filled in these wells to stop him having access. Now here's the thing. The wells were not filled in because they had no water left in them. There's still water in these wells. The wells were not filled in because they no longer served a purpose. The wells were not filled in because they had no value. They were not filled in because their time was up. They were not filled in because they'd reached their use-by date. They were not filled in because they had nothing to offer. They were not filled in because they had no life left or blessing left to impart to people. On the contrary, they were filled in by the Philistines because they were the lifeblood of the prosperity that Isaac was experiencing. He had many flocks and many servants. And the way you continue to look after your servants and your flocks, no matter which way you slice it and dice it, you need access to water. And a well is simply a structure that gives you access to that which you need to sustain life. They filled it in because they were envious of him and they knew that the lifeblood of his prosperity was coming through those wells, through the water. The wells actually had water. They had a purpose. They had value. Their time was not up. The use-by date was not exceeded. They had something to offer and they had the capacity to still impart blessing and life. And so these Philistines filled them up so that he couldn't have access to that. They were not filled in because they were not fit for use anymore, but to stop the blessing that was in them from flowing forward to the next generation. They were filled in so that the next generation wouldn't have access to that, which provided blessing, life and sustenance to the previous generation. The Philistines knew that Isaac's prosperity was linked to his ability to continue to access the wells. But here's the good news... Isaac knew that as well. Isaac was no dummy. He knew he needed water. And he knew that there were wells with water there. And so in chapter 26, verse 18, it says this. It says, and Isaac dug again. Everyone say again. Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham's father. He's not digging a new well here. He's not... He's not having to start from scratch. He's going, there was something there that still has purpose and still has life. And, and if I go back to that well that was dug and dig that out, there's still some great things in there that can help me in my future prosperity and in the place that I'm going in life. So Isaac redug the wells because he knew that the water was still there. And he knew the water was still good. And he knew that what was in those wells was a key to his continued prosperity. See, redigging the wells is not about finding something new. It's about reclaiming something lost. It's not about finding something new. It's about reclaiming something lost. 
And that lost thing still has value. That lost thing can still bring life and blessing and prosperity into your life, but it's lost. So often in life, I think we, we're always looking ahead for the new, aren't we? we? We always want the fandangle new thing, you know? If I just have that new thing, then everything will be better. If I just have the new thing, then if I just find a new church, I'll actually be happy. If, if, I just get, uh, uh, if we just got a new worship leader and band, maybe you'd be happier with worship. If, if I just had a new wife, I'd trade in my wife and everything will be better if I just upgrade to a new model or a new husband, you know? It, it, the, the answer for what's missing here, what I need is to find something new. But redigging wells is not about finding something new. It's about reclaiming something that's been lost. It's about looking back and going, not everything back in the past was bad. There were some things and some spaces and some places in the past of my life that have given real blessing and prosperity into my world. And maybe, just maybe, going back to some of those things is going to be a good thing for me in terms of my relationship with God, maybe my relationship with other people. Who knows? Redigging wells is not about finding something new. It's about reclaiming something lost. It's about finding our way back to some of the sources of life and prosperity that we knew in the past and that can still contribute to our future. See, God still wants his people to prosper in all areas, in all areas, not just sheep and cattle and livestock, right? 3 John 1, verse 2, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. Sometimes when we hear the word prosperity, it's it's either taken to one extreme where it's a million dollars, new cars, and, you know, 15 houses and all the extremities of it, But then there can be, as a reaction to that, the other extreme, where we just think God wants us all to have holes in our jeans. I have holes in my jeans because it's trendy, by the way, when I wear them jeans. It's not because I can't afford jeans. I've got holes in my jeans and and that God wants us to send used tea bags to missionaries and all that kind of stuff. I remember when I uh, was 19 years of age, I got saved. Six months later, I went into youth with a mission. And my dad, who's not a believer, was at a shopping center. Now, there, there was a beautiful, beautiful church. It's a very small little uniting church. They got behind me, and they used to support me, I think it was $66.13 a month. $66.13 a month. And, and my dad was pushing a trolley through uh, a shopping center in, in the town, and one of these ladies stopped him from the church. They knew he was my dad, and they started chatting. And she said this to him. He's a non-believer. He doesn't get it. And I'm his son, and I'm at the time living in a third world country. I was living in India. And this lady said to my dad, yeah, as a church board, we're thinking of cutting his support back because we think he needs to know what it's like to live on the poverty line. At $66.13 a month. Well, it didn't go down really, really well. But some people have that attitude when it comes to blessing. That, you know, they look at somebody that has a nice car and think, what, what did you do wrong? Who are you ripping off? Who are you, ch-? you know what? God blesses people. God blesses people. And we've got to be okay with that. And guess what? God determines the type of blessing that he brings into a person's life. And we've got to be okay with that. Amen? Got to be okay with that. But, but John prays here, and here's what John says, I pray that you may prosper in all things and in health just as your soul prospers. Just as your soul prospers. So God wants us to prosper holistically. It's not just about... You, you, can, you can have the richest house on the biggest hill overlooking the most beautiful beach and be driving the most fancy car but not be prospering. You can be Mother Teresa living in the streets of Calcutta with nothing because you're following the call of God and feel like you're the richest human being on planet Earth. So prosperity is not only about material things, but we do see in the Word of God it can include material things. But the point I want to make here is that in the New Testament, John's still praying for these people going, I'm actually praying that you'll prosper. You know, I, I pray for all of you, not by name, but I pray for every one of you every day. I come into this place, and I, I, if you could peek through the window, it would look like I'm preaching to myself. But I pace up and down the front here, and I pray for your prosperity. I pray God would prosper you physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, relationally, financially. I pray for each person here every day. I want you to prosper in all those areas holistically in your life. I want you to prosper. Because as you prosper, you take that prosperity out, and you bless others. And your life is better. Let's face it. It's better, to have, it's better to have food on the table tonight than not. It's kind of common sense. If God gave me the option, said, Alan, I can put you just below the poverty line. You can eat and struggle for the rest of your life or I can make you really, really rich, have lots of money. I'd take the lots of money. I'm sorry, I would. 
I'm not saying I'd spend it all on myself, but I feel like I could do a bit more with lots than I could with the little. But I'd still use the little for God's glory. The point is that God's okay with us prospering. Here's the message that I want to leave with you to think about today. Over the next few weeks, next three weeks, we've got Gary Hurigan coming in four weeks. I'm looking forward to that. In the lead up to that, I want to talk about a bit of a theme here. When I think about the church, I can't help but think that maybe our future prosperity lies not in continuously trying to find something new, but maybe it lies in reclaiming something lost. Let me say that again. Maybe our future prosperity, and I'm talking about the church in general, but when I talk about the church in general, I'm also talking about you because you are the what? Church. So maybe, when you think corporately or individually, maybe our future prosperity lies not in continuously trying to find something new, but in reclaiming something that's been lost. As we go on this journey, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will speak to us. He'll speak to us. Maybe the key to reclaiming the vitality, the passion and the faith that some people in this room once had in Jesus. Maybe it's not going to be found in seeking something new. Maybe you're going to reclaim it by going back and finding something that's been lost in your life. Let me see if any of these following illustrations resonate with you. I'm going to talk about me right now. This is Alan Kirch, and I'm not saying it's you. I'm going to open up my heart, and I'm going to speak to you. I remember when I first came to faith, and maybe, maybe you're like me, maybe you're not. But I remember when I first came to faith, I never even noticed that the church was not perfect. I, I didn't even notice that the church wasn't perfect. When I first came to Jesus, I was just in love with him in awe of the fact that he could take a sinner and a screwball like me and turn my life around and do something good with it. I was so in awe with him, I didn't even notice that I was in a church that was imperfect. Our church at the time had a, and I don't want to get controversial here, so there was a symbol on the pulpit of this little church that, in my view, was not a Christian symbol and should not have been there and was put there for wrong reasons. And you know what? Everybody in the church only found out later on. People are up in arms about it. I didn't even notice what it was. I didn't even know that there's this ungodly symbol on the pulpit that the preacher's preaching from every Sunday. I didn't notice that there were people that were backbiting and arguing and fighting and this one over here didn't like that one and, and this one hated the... I didn't notice any of that. I just loved Jesus. It was just simple. I didn't notice it. I didn't notice that the preaching was below par. I had no idea this preacher wasn't good. I had no idea. Found out later on from everybody, but I had no idea at the time. He was not good. He would open this collection of ancient documents, and I felt like I always found something in there to snack on. I always found something that fed me. I always walked away going, oh, wow, never seen that before. Haven't heard that put that way before. But, but apparently he wasn't great. I didn't notice. I didn't notice that the coffee was instant coffee. I didn't notice. <laughs> Anyone notice that our coffee's instant? I didn't notice that it was instant coffee that they were serving in the cafeteria. I didn't notice that the worship band were only able to play three chords. C, G, and D. That's it. C, G, D, C, G, D. We played the same songs over and over. Why? Because they had to find songs that were C, D, G. C, D, G, C, D, G, C, D, G. I did, but I didn't notice they only played three chords. And I didn't notice that they couldn't even play the three chords properly. I just did. I didn't notice other people did. I didn't notice. I just, they played and sang and I closed my eyes and I went, Jesus, isn't this life awesome? Isn't this great? Isn't this good? <laughs> Giving finances to my church was not a struggle. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Giving finances to my church, it was not a struggle. I wasn't running around looking for theological loopholes to get me out of it. Oh, well, that's not quite, oh, it doesn't say, oh, it doesn't that, and the tithe's 10, and we don't do 10. I didn't even care about that. I wasn't looking for reasons not to give. And I wasn't expecting the pastor on Sunday, every Sunday, to stand up and have to convince me and motivate me every seven days why I should give finance to the church. I loved the church. And God didn't just have me, he had my money, and I didn't think too complicated about it. Other than when I sang that song, I surrender all, I actually felt like, no, that's what I want to do here. I want to come into this experience with you, God. I don't want to dip my toes on the edge and play around. I, I kind of felt like, you know, there's this funny thing now we say to people, would you like to give your heart to Jesus? No one ever said to me, give your heart to Jesus. They said, do you want to give Jesus your life? And that's what I thought I did. And so 
when I did that, I actually thought that's what it meant. And part of my life was what I would earn when I'd go to the chicken farm and cut bones out of dead chickens. And I didn't expect to be pumped up to have to do it. I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it, and I wasn't looking for ways out. I knew God was with me no matter how I felt. No matter how I felt. I never made a connection between my feelings and God being with me. He said he's never going to leave me or forsake me. And I'm having a great day today, and I know God's with me, and there's spring in my step. And then the next day, I'm bawling my eyes out because the world's falling apart. But I'm still talking to him like he's right there because I just, that had nothing to do with whether God was with me, how I felt. It just didn't matter. He said he was with me. I gave you my life. I believe you. You're there. Last grade, I'm on a mountain, I'm in a valley, you're there. I didn't realize that prayer was meant to be so complicated. I used to put these where thou should have been. Huh? I used to, I used to, I know, it's shocking. If you could hear me pray today, you'd still go, I don't think God's listening to you. You got it wrong there, brother. You didn't say the right word. You should have put a thee where thou. Yeah. All this, I didn't realize it was so complicated. I used to just literally be driving in my car or sitting at my window and just be looking at a tree and going, oh God, look at that. God, that bird, isn't that really? Like I just had conversations with God, I didn't realize that I had to make it really long and throw in 20 Bible verses. and I didn't realize that I had to use the Bible to manipulate and convince God to do something he said he was going to do anyway. I didn't realize that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with praying the scripture. I still pray the word of God. But what I'm saying is there was a simplicity to all of that stuff. I didn't realize uh, gathering together with other believers at a church service, it was something I genuinely looked forward to. I didn't mind being with people like you. Now, before I became a Christian, I didn't want to be with people like you because <laughs> you were weird people. And some of you still probably are. I probably am. We're probably a room full of weird people. It doesn't matter. The point is, I actually wanted to be with Christians because I, I, there was this whole new other side of life for me. And, and even, though, even though there were things that we didn't have in common, we had one thing in common, and that was the cross. That was Jesus. And I couldn't wait to gather, whether it was going to be at a church or somebody had a Bible study or somebody had a prayer meeting, I just wanted to be with God's people. And I didn't allow my sins and my mistakes to get in the way of a bold and real relationship with Jesus. I was so stupid, I actually thought if I sinned, that he actually had forgiven me and that his grace was there and that he would still want to be my friend. I was so naive and untheologically trained that I actually thought God liked me, apart from my performance, apart from how good I was doing. When I did well, I didn't think that God would give me extra brownie points. And when I was doing less, he, yeah, I, I didn't think, my, my brain didn't go to that performance based type of a thing. That, 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 that's a, a, a picture of, of what I was. And that's what it was like for me in the beginning. There was a simplicity and a focus to my faith. And I was simply enjoying relationship with God and with his people. I was drinking from some wells back then. And that was what they were producing. Those wells were producing that stuff in my life. But somewhere between the sands of time, those wells got filled in. Those wells got filled in. And I know this. It wasn't my idea to fill those wells in. But I got an idea whose idea it was. Because I actually have an enemy. He wants to cut me off from those things that caused me to begin to prosper, to continue to prosper, and to become very prosperous. So remember, the problem is not that the water stopped running, but that I stopped running to the water. The well was still there. It was filled in. I love what Isaac did. He didn't just go, well, forget that, I'll move on. And we'll try to find something up in the future that'll, that'll keep that, that, that vitality and that passion. He said, no, 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 there, there's this well here. And I know what's in this well. I'm going to go back and I'm going to redig something that my father's redone. If we look at the book of Acts, we see the, 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 the writer Luke, he gives us all these progress reports, doesn't he, in the book of Acts. I'll, I'll throw them at you very, very quickly. And we can see here that in the first 30 years of the church, that the church began to prosper, it continued prospering, and it became very prosperous. Acts 2.47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Acts 5.14, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Acts 6, 7, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. Acts 9, 31, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Acts 12, 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Acts 16, 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. 
Acts 19, 20, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I think the Thessalonians summed it up. When, 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 when the, the disciples came to Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17 and verse 6, they summed it up best when they said this, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. These people who've turned the world upside down have come here too. But before God's people can turn the world upside down again, maybe, maybe God needs to turn his people right side up again. Maybe there are some things back there. Maybe there are some wells back here that need to be redug, that still have plenty to offer us. But we're too busy looking out here for the new fandangle, next big thing. And maybe, I wonder, I wonder whether God wouldn't be saying to some of us, hey, go back and remember that time. That time when you just wanted to be with God's people. Go back and remember that time when you didn't care about talking to people about Jesus. You weren't embarrassed to say, I'm going to church on Sunday. Go back to that time where you weren't trying to find reasons not to give or not to serve or not to help out. Go back to that time when your passion for Jesus was so real to you and so evident to others. Go back to those times and have a look. What were some of the wells in your life that you were drinking from back then? Because what was, what was in the well, it's the water, it's what was in the well that produced that kind of stuff. That was the leaves on the tree. But there was somewhere that you were drinking from. And that was bringing life and vitality and stuff into your world. The, the early church, they grew and they grew and they grew and they grew and they grew. In persecution, under suffering, with all kinds of things against them. It looks a lot like the enemy has come on in and filled up some of the wells of the early church. Why would he do that? Well, because he knows that they're the lifeblood of the church's prosperity. Same reason he'd come on in and fill up some of the wells in your life. Because he knows some of that stuff produced some great stuff in your world. And I don't think that any of us fill up them wells on purpose. They just get filled up. They just get filled up. We stop going to them. And before you know it, we feel flat again. Our passion's dissipated. Our, our faith is dying and waning. Our spark's going out. Well, what's the next thing? Maybe I've got to upgrade to the new thing. And maybe God's saying, no, 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 why don't you go back and have a look? What are some of the wells that you used to drink from? Because some of that stuff is still good stuff. Over the next three weeks, I'm going to go back and we're going to have a look at some wells that the early church actually drank from. We're going to look at some wells that the early church hung around. And we're going to ask ourselves the question, is that stuff still relevant for today? Can God still bring back into our lives that which he brought into their lives way back then? Instead of looking ahead going, well, what have we got to, we've got to have an upgraded sound system or we better have a bigger building or maybe we've got to, the church has got to get through this current cultural climate or we need more Christians in politics or we need more this, we need more that. Maybe God's saying, you know what, stop looking at something new and something fandang up ahead. Go back, redig some of those ancient wells and let's see whether there's still some light Life and some vitality in some of those things. The Philistines filled up the wells in the hope that Isaac would move on from them. That God wanted him to stay and redig. And I wonder whether God wants us to stay and redig some things in our own story. Hey, I'll get the worship guys back. We're going to finish up. We're going to finish up. Maybe it's time the church started reclaiming some of its lost wells. Maybe it's time we went back to some of those things that might not look real sexy. Hey? Might feel a bit ancient, maybe. Might think they're a bit outdated. Might feel like we've theologically moved on from that. We're smarter now. We're, you know, we're... I used to pray this prayer all the time. I used to pray and I used to say, God, would you do for us today what you did for the church in the book of Acts? Would you be to us the God that you were to the church in the book of Acts. And I remember clear as a bell one day, just feeling the Holy Spirit stop me as I prayed that. And he said, I will be, Alan, when you be to me the church that I had back in the book of Acts. You want me to do what I did then? You want to see what happened back then? You want to see that in your generation? Then be the kinds of people that I was able to use back then. And I wonder whether I have some wells I need to go and redig, and I wonder whether you do too this morning.